Now, uh, you know how I like to start these sometimes. I like to tell you uh, what I think is going to happen. <clears throat> and then later on, we can compare that model to what actually happens, the real data. <laughs> what I think is going to happen today is the GIMIC is going to um, continue uh, with the uh, the readings from the plant 2019 spatial statistics book. If people are so inclined, I, I think there will be an opportunity to follow along with the code, uh, especially if you had downloaded the data in one of the previous sessions and have it to hand. But in a moment, we'll try to um, we'll try to give a pointer to the data download and we'll give you a few minutes to set up if this is the first time here and you want to do it. Just to remind people, we have gone through this a few times for the first few chapters. Um, I did, I think, the first one, and then I handed it over to Jimic, and you've done the last couple. And uh, this is an important field. It's um, something that I think most PhD students, even if you do experimental biology or um, you think you do non-spatial biology, I still think that this is one of the tools that will make you a more powerful scientist and also increase your employability as a uh, if you're looking for a PhD program for PhDs if you're looking for a postdoc for postdocs or or almost literally any job that handles data I view this as a pretty important one I've mentioned the plant book a number of times and told you what I think of it I love it it's one of the best books for applied scientists out there for sta spatial statistics it's not the easiest it's the best rigorous one, and uh, it's very accessible to non-statisticians, but it's not easy stuff. It, it, there is a learning curve to it, and I think the goal here, if you're new to, to this, anybody can get something from these, even if it's just awareness that this world exists. If you already are proficient with R, you'll be able to keep up with the code. The code base is very tidy. There's one provided by the author, the style is very different from the style that we usually practice here in Herrig. It's definitely different from my personal style. Um, it's very terse and it's not commented as much as I like to comment my own code, even for my own personal consumption. So with those caveats, I just want to say that <clears throat> um, George, who I think is in the chat, um, is going to give us a final um, week, maybe the final week, on Deep Lab Cut, we've had a few from George in the past couple of weeks. Hi, Hello. Hi, I was just saying, I hope it's the final one. <laughs> yeah, you need a break from it after this. I get it. So we appreciate it. No, no, no. No, I'm, I'm, I mean, like, for everyone, it's great fun for me, but I mean, for everyone else, it's a friend Deep Lab <clears> Cut. <laughs> we're, we're expecting great things in the next one. So thank you. Um, and the week after that, I thought we'd just do something different. Um, I have been working on a project that involves some web scraping. It's fairly simple in a way, but um, I realized even though the the data itself is very simple, that some of the steps I was having to go through in this in this project with a with a student were yeah not so simple. And I thought. Um, a lot of people might be interested in the steps one can go through to clean data in a programmatic way. So I'm going to present a little bit about web scraping and uh, some of the base R tools to do that um, week after next. OK, now I promised what I would do is to show the. Um, the um, <clears throat> website here and go to the schedule. I'll just drop the link in the chat in case um, people don't have it handy to make it convenient. Haven't updated the website in a few weeks, so I will, I swear, do this before next week. I've been deep in the weeds. I've submitted literally today two grants as the Harper PI for a total of about a million pounds, and it has about broken me with all my other travel. Um, but I'm through the weeds now and I only have emails and other uh, admin to keep up with. Uh, and I will catch this up now. <clears throat> I do have on this page um, all the data and all the code. So if you haven't already downloaded it, 
I'll just give a link in the chat now for the data if you want to um, download it and um, and follow along with Jimic. And uh, I think what I'm going to do is I'll I'll leave the obviously the the link is here for all the code, but I think I'll leave it to Jimic to share the code that he's going to run with you when he introduces it. The last thing I'd say before I shut up and let um, Jimic go is that um, I have to leave a little bit early today, so I'll be bowing quietly out of chat about um, 4.45, and I'll just say my goodbye now. So introducing Jimic and Plant 219. Okay. Um, I will first uh, mention what bits of code from Plant Book we are going to run. Uh, this will be only the uh, 322 two, and uh, I believe 351 or 352 and I have a bit of my own code to present which can be hopefully a little more illustrative. Hopefully. <laughs> OK, so let me share my screen with. Uh, slide of with the slide of my presentation and then we'll jump. I will do some talking and then we'll jump to the code. Hopefully it's going to work nicely. Um, I will share the entire screen. OK, so. Second talk of the same chapter. And it's not going to be all. Uh, chapter three. Uh, from Plant's book uh, deals with the uh, uh, with the uh, autocorrelated or spatially correlated data and uh, the effect of the spatial correlation for um, of statistics for the result of statistics, for example, for the, the distribution of the mean. Uh, I will briefly recap what I was saying last time. Uh, last time we learned about how spatial data uh, how spatial data differ from non-spatial data. So in short, the non-spatial data are like a bag of observations where the order of observation does not uh, matter, uh, by, uh, while the spatial data have got an underlying spatial structure uh, where the notion of distance makes sense. Here we've got distance. For example, we can measure it here, and there is some increment, some value that is measured usually, because for point data, that may not be the case. Um, so if not distance, at least the neighboring relationship can be um, can be determined. Due to the underlying processes, the spatial data observations usually tend to be more similar in one region uh, when, when the data are closer to each other, the observations are closer to each other in the sense, closer in the sense of this distance. And, and the author of the book comes up with two reasons uh, is explaining two reasons why it can be so, and these are trends uh, to which section three to one is dedicated, and the presence of a spatially correlated error, which is discussed in section three to two and modeled in further sections. Um, last time we have already discussed trends, and uh, I was present ex presenting script through three to one. Uh, which was modeling some data containing trends and correlated error and uncorrelated error. Um, I will not rerun the script, but I will show th this image I'm presenting now uh, and do some more talking over this one because it's quite useful. Uh, so in in the script three to one was uh, cooking up some fake data, uh, and this is the example. Uh, on one di dimensional data containing uh, deterministic trend, correlated error and uncorrelated error. Uh, and the, we were only look, uh, also looking at these images. Uh, that was also an example of spatial data with a trend. This time um, the spatial basis uh, has two dimensions, X and Y. Uh, and there was also an example on real data 
that was uh, sand content in some samples in the field. So this is fake data uh, in two dimensions. This is fake data in one dimension. We've got the component is trend. We already talked about it, correlated error and uncorrelated error. Um, I will briefly remind that uh, in uh, trend, fitting a trend over a spatial, over spatial data is like fitting trends uh, in linear models. Um, basically, when you've got uh, some explanatory variables in non-spatial data, you can have some explanatory variables that are numeric, that are um, uh, continuous. And in that case, over such a variable or several variables, uh, one can build a um, space in which the notion of distance makes sense. And this is why we can uh, fit trends, fit models um, in non-spatial data uh, too. Um, it, it doesn't have to necessarily to be a continuous variable. It can also be an ordered factor. It should also work. Um, so it works in a similar way in spatial data. Here in spatial data, we've got um, some spatial component with, which is explicitly present and over which the trends um, can be fitted. So we can see that the uh, final, the, the, the data we are measuring, the red ones, are a sum, it, in every point, are a sum of uh, uh, trend, correlated error, and uncorrelated error in this model. Uh, but now uh, let's wonder for a moment what's the uh, what the difference is between trend and correlated error. Okay, and here even the book says that the difference can be sometimes vague. Um, the author of the book is quoting some other researcher. Sorry, I can't remember the name. Uh, who says that what is one person's error? can be a correlated error structure for uh, another. And I thought a little about that. And I think that a good analogy would be uh, mixed effect models where you've got a um, fixed effect or you've got random effect. So mm, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I think in my opinion, it's a good uh, analogy. So fixed effect is measurable. Um, while uh, the random effect is a way to handle all the stuff that we suspect can have an um, uh, influence um, on the data, can affect the data uh, on the dependent variable, but it's not object of the study. So um, that really, uh, that problem of what is a trend and what is a correlated error quite often can depend on uh, how you look at the data, what are you really interested in, and uh, how you're going to explain the variability in your uh, dependent variable. Uh, secondly, I think it depends on um, the spatial scale. And thirdly, we already know that both the trend and the correlated error can be present in the data. That's, that's how I see it. Um, mathematically, Trend and correlated error are formali formalized mathematically in a different way. Uh, trend is a function uh, of the spatial component vector, while um, the correlated error structure is a function of distance between observations. Um, so, for example, the difference between values taken here and here will be will be larger than uh, between a value taken here and here because this distance is smaller this distance is larger so there is some sort of a function that links the distance and uh, the difference in measured values this is not going to be a deterministic function because the the measured variable is a random variable. So rather than uh, looking at a deterministic function 
uh, linking the variables in different regions of our data set, we are looking at statistical properties. Basically, we are mostly interested in mean and the, the mean and the variance. Uh, but sometimes we can be interested in further mo moments of the distribution. Um, so um, let's go to let's go to another slide. Last time I mentioned briefly, I mentioned stationarity, and I would like to explain it briefly in the context of what I have just said. Uh, stationarity is when the uh, statistics of a sample does not depend on what region of the data set, the spatial data set, the sample was taken. And in a similar way, I mentioned that, uh, the, that the correlated error is described, can be described in the, as a function of statistical properties and distance between the data. So when this statistical properties is constant all over the data set, the data is stationary. Obviously, we know that the trend can be one of the reasons of stationarity because when we look at this region, the mean of the observations will be different than here. And if we do, if we find a trend, if we fit a trend, we are able to subtract the trend from the data and get the, uh, like bring the mean to zero and play only with the remaining um, with the remaining uh, statistical um, uh, properties. Um, OK, so it's a time for the first script, which is which is um, presenting that script three to two from plant. Uh, can I just copy it? I think I, it should work if I just copy it into the chat or not. You might Will be able work? to drag it over, but if you go ahead and start up the code, I'll help you and drag it over for you. OK, thank you. In I know that in in webmail you can just control C, control V, and it's quite an easy way to make a uh, to make a, um, an attachment. Okay, so Bill Gates is laughing at you right now. Don't make it worse. Yeah, well, <laughs> I know why <laughs> because I always get a warning: no more copies. <laughs> Good. Uh, so uh, script three to two from plant and uh, an explanation of um, independent um, independent observations, dependent and the presence of trend based on tossing a coin. I slightly modified it. Um, so we are run, we are tossing a coin a hundred times. Head is the vector with a number of uh, uh, with the result of our uh, coin toss, and this is uh, the generation of uh, uh, of uh, binomially distributed random values uh, with the probability zero point five. So it's like a fair coin. That's the vector of our results. That's roughly what we would expect. And I have also added uh, the percentage, the, the ratio of um, of um, heads that were thrown. Uh, of course, if we rerun it, we'll get exactly the same because there's a set seed. Uh, so we can rerun this bit of code. And here, down there in the uh in the console we can see that the results are roughly around 0 0.5 this is what we are expecting that it is like throwing a 
fair coin. This time, the result of a coin cost depends on the previous one. The probability this statement if else says that if head if the uh, if uh, in the toss number i um, the result was larger than zero, so effectively it was one, then the probability of the next um, head will be 0 0.8. And if there was a uh, tail, tails, the probability of head will be 0 0.2. So it, it's like a stickiness in the data. If there was a head, the next one will more likely be head. Let's run it. OK, and it's perhaps difficult to observe in this data, but basically the heads have a tendency to stick together and tails have a tendency to stick together. Let's see. Just for several times what the proportion of heads and tails will be. Uh, that would require a more thorough investigation. But we are somewhere around 0 0.5. But just to my impression is that we are veering off the middle of, of 0 0.5 by further uh, by further um, values than uh, by larger values than previously. And uh, the next script 3.3, if you want to run for yourself, uh, is delivering a tool that makes it easier to analyze that uh, effect. But I will uh, rather run it using um, using um, more hopefully evocative script uh, with some plants that grow in the field uh, rather than this. OK. So um, this is. This is a um, simulation with a trend we can see that the probability of coming up heads is increasing with every toss with every coin toss mm -hmm. and i have truncated the result because when i uh, i wanted to have a larger amount of uh, a larger number of uh, tosses um, so once the probability is higher than one, uh, the, an error is, thro is thrown. Uh, so if we look at that, there is still around 0 0.5 in this short um, uh, vector. If we do the plot, we can have a look at that, that the number of tails is larger in the left part of the um, of the picture and the number of heads is prevailing uh, here. So it's like more and more heads coming up. So this is the example of a trend. This was the example of a stickiness in data of a correlated structure uh, of a correlated structure. And basically why? Why are we dealing with that? We are dealing with uh, with um, with these simple and less simple examples because uh, the presence of correlated, spatially correlated uh, error um, can result and will result uh, in uh, it will affect the um, the inference based on statistics. It completely changes the statistical properties of the data. Um, how to, um, that, that's script 3.4. How to um, measure the statistical properties of the data? Normally, we assume that uh, the data, uh, data uh, drawn from a population are independent the observations are independent. Uh, when the observations are not independent, we are violating an assumption behind many statistical tests, for example, t-test. Uh, 
this script is presenting an alternative to a t-test. Uh, this is so-called um, permutation test or randomization test. Uh, how is it? How is it done? Uh, this is when you want to compare. Uh, um, when you want to compare two samples, um, just to find out whether the mean between the two samples is large enough to this, to um, state that um, they come from different distributions. You can use t-test while there is normality, while there are uh, if, with the assumption of normality and independence. But uh, there is also another method uh, which boils down to a very simple uh, rule. You just combine the samples, and from the combined uh, from the combined uh, pool of observations, you draw the samples with the same number of observations as before, but randomly, and when you do it many times, you get a distribution of how the differences of uh, how uh, a distribution of differences of means and look if uh, the original uh, if the original um, difference of means between the two original samples is large enough to um, justify saying that they come from different distributions. So why is a vector? numerical vector of uh, with uh, normal distribution. Uh, this is a definition of uh, short uh, of a test. It's like a function uh, of a test with two fun two sided alternative. OK, and we can see that it the P value from the test. Uh, this is a, a single sample test uh, is showing that the uh, sample is coming from normal distribution because it's not extremely, the p-value is not extremely small. A Monte Carlo simulation of a t-test will be running the same test many times. It already happened. Okay, now. And the uh, vector u is um, contains uh, uh, if, if it's true in every position, it's true. Um, the value, the p-value was less than 0 0.5, and the proportion of um, uh, the proportion of these observations is indeed zero, around 0 0.5. So this is how the t-test works. It's sort of a presentation of how the t-test works. Now we yeah, are gener yeah. Hey Jimek, will you um, will you run a histogram on um, on the Y? Oh, <clears throat> a histogram on the Y. Not a histogram on the Y. Hold on. No, no. Give us, give it's us just a short... give us a table of U of capital U. You give uh, us the mean of U. Okay, rather than like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this I wanted to just break in here for a second and because this is covering quite a lot of ground and the book doesn't explain it whatsoever. And you're explaining some things in a lot of detail and um, other things. I just wanted to add something that you didn't mention about this is uh, that this um, <clears throat> this way of replicating data um, is a way of thinking about statistics. We, we often don't think about this. We don't have to think about it as scientists, but um, when we when we draw a sample, and in this case, he's talking about a spatial sample, but uh, he's, at least he's building up to a spatial sample in the book. But when you draw a sample from a population, whether it's um, in an experiment, the cows you feed, and how much they eat, and you've measured how much they eat, or whether it's cows you've milked, or whether it is um, blood pressure with patients that do or don't have um, blood pressure medicine, something like that. Anything that you can measure in an experimental or observational setting. When, when you sample it, you really don't, I mean, philosophically, you don't actually care about the specific sample that you've made. 
not as a scientist anyway. Instead, you care about the ability of the thing you measured from that sample to um, allow you to make an inference about any cow in the whole world you may have measured or any patient in the whole world you may have measured. And we know that there is sampling error. And this little trick that um, the Jimic has run through here of um, rapidly simulating a lot of a lot of sample draws is a way of um, it's an alternative way of of creating the the frequency distribution of yes or no. You conclude there's a difference for your sample. And, and actually, um, I don't think Hayden is here in the chat with us today, but some of you may have mentioned um, somebody asked uh, quite a complicated question uh, yesterday or a couple of days ago in the chat. And I have briefly answered it before the meeting today, but it it also is a way of uh, using randomization to uh, explore the parameters in an experiment. I just wanted to say something about that because um, he moves quite quite fast in the book and in the code, mm -hmm. but it's actually quite of a neat tool. It, it used to be a, a kind of radical when I was doing my PhD. Uh, ra randomization tests were considered a, a fairly radical alternative, for at least for scientists, a, a fairly uh, cutting edge alternative to traditional statistics. But now we're just kind of flopping it out in the in the same breath as we're introducing, you know, why it's relevant to spatial statistics specifically. It's just it's just one of the tools in the toolbox. I just wanted to say that it's very similar to what Hayden mentioned it's very very much a simpler example of um, what Hayden did with mixed effects models we'll probably read that paper in the future so put a pin in that mm -hmm. sure uh, so well I think that the, it is uh, quite easy to do randomization tests nowadays with uh, with tools like R where we've got 10,000 replicates here and it, Took a blink of an eye to to do uh, the 10,000 uh, t tests, uh, and the assumption under that is the uh, is the, the uh, random generators work as they should. <laughs> okay, so let's hope they work as they should. Uh, Here we are generating two uh, samples, Y1 and Y2. Both come from a normal distribution and have five observations. That's the statement. And we observe a difference of means. That's D different of means between uh, those two samples. Uh, and this is an example of what's going on inside the permutation test but just once, it's not repeated many times. So the sample is joined together uh, here using concatenation. Then it is, uh, 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 then it is uh, scrambled, so the order is random, and we, sh we split it between a sample of length from one to five, and uh, the, uh, we're, we're just taking the first and the second half of the of the sample. Let's run it again, so that we know it's fine. Um, okay, and this is the difference of uh, samples. And here we are doing it with ten permutations. We're doing it ten times. Um, Return D prime. OK, this is a function uh, to do it 10 times. And replicate it. Uh, OK, because we, uh, we need to uh, compare the original, uh, the value of the original difference between means with the entire distribution obtained from the um, permutations. Let's run the code. Till the end. Okay. So this is zero 
79. It's still quite a high um, p value. So the conclusion would be that these uh, samples y1 and y2 do not really differ. And let's compare it with the result of t test. That's the traditional method of, of doing it. And it's 0 0.72, so it's fairly close. OK, so just to wrap up the results of um, uh, the script 3.4, uh, t-test or another traditional way of comparing statistics, of putting statistics into the distribution context. Uh, and the other one, uh, is the permutation test, which does not depend on any um, any theoretical distribution and is very valuable uh, often in the context of spatial statistics where the data can have very wild distributions. Uh, sure. Uh, I was, uh, I think I will start from my own script now. Uh, rather than going to 3.5, uh, 351. Uh, as I said, uh, we are interested in uh, in these matters because uh, the, the because the presence of spatial correlation uh, affects the results of statistical tests. Let's clear the table. Um, we'll be growing plants, some plants in a field. This is a function I will be using later. I will not explain it now, but basically it does some sort of a permutation test uh, and it's uh, outputting. Its output is the, uh, uh, the confidence interval for a mean for the number of plants in the field. First, we'll make a field on which there will initially be eight plants. And there will be 15 growth cycles. That's the size of the field. I will explain it in a moment when we've got the plot. OK, so this is our field. One, it's got just one dimension. It's, it's got 80 units long and we've got some grid to uh, to, to, to guide the eye when we are looking at the plants. And over that field, a bird flew once and it felt the urge of the nature and planted eight plants in a known manner. Uh, one moment. And these plants started growing and were spreading like we can see here. I will make it a little larger. So every plant is reproducing so that, uh, okay, yeah, I've got this. Sorry, I've got a separate uh, script for that. Okay. Every plant, this is one plant, and it's breeding like that, that its um, offspring can, uh, it's breeding just one plant, uh, and the uh, probability of uh, uh, growing the new plant uh, is distributed um uh, normally around the plant so the further we go the lower the probability of getting a new uh, a new plant and let's have another plant here is another plant with a new probability of breeding the next plant here is plant number 3 and this is just the offspring of one of a single plant what we can see here is so-called Wiener process or Brownian process, the illustration of a Brownian mo motion. Um, and it's 
in nature we can really explain that uh, such processes can happen uh, for example if the plant uh, grows as another stem it can go uh, further it will never go very far but it will rather concentrate around uh, around the plant so from the initial population of uh, eight plants uh, in every season we get more plants and will be and one plant lasts for for the five seasons so this is the process where the plants are growing in the field in every season there's 40 plants present and we can see that they concentrate around the original plants uh, and now we will be sampling Uh, we'll be trying to assess um, the mean number of plants per unit in the field, per square unit in the field or per length unit in the field. And that's the distribution of uh, the means that are uh, obtained in multiple sampling. As a, a reference distribution, we've got a distribution which looks, sorry, which looks like that. This is 40 plants, but they are not clumped together. We can rerun the code. And they are just uh, randomly distributed without uh, spatial correlation. And this is the uh, histogram of mm, how the means are distributed when we sample from uh, from the non spatially correlated um, uh, population. So that's the one that's the spatially correlated. And this is what the population looks like. It it's concentrating around the original plants. Uh, and we cannot infer a lot from just one um, from just one simulation. So this is why I've got a script which runs the simulation many times. And we'll have a look at um at the uh, confidence intervals for the mean okay the red uh, lines and red points are for the spatially correlated data the blue ones are uncorrelated. This is the mean for every for every new field. And this is the confidence interval we are getting by. Basically permutation test uh, by running uh, by sampling many times from uh, from the population of um, these 40 plants and counting how many plants there are in an interval. Uh, so even uh, I will not do any formal statistical um, analysis of these results, but we can see that basically in the correlated, when there is the uh, spatial correlation, uh, the confidence intervals are much broader, and also the mean of the mean of the means is lower for the correlated data than for the uncorrelated. So obviously there is quite a strong statistical result of the data of the uh, of the clumpiness of the plants, even if there is exactly the same number of plants present in the field. So this is this is what is what it's all really about. We've got the same number of uncorrelated plants. There's 40 plants growing here, these lines. And there is also 40 plants growing here, but they are only spatially distributed in a different way. And the procedure to assess the mean, uh, the, the protocol uh, with which a hypothetical researcher uh, is trying to assess the mean uh, number of plants per unit in the field, for example, per such an 
interval of this length is exactly the same, but the researcher is arriving at completely different, um, completely different um, conclusions. So this is the difference between the this side of the uh, plot and this side of the plot is only due to the different spatial distribution um, of uh, plants because the number of plants is exactly the same in the field. So it means that the researcher will need to uh, have a this different strategy uh, or for example, uh, sample, take more samples from the field, take more observations in the field, from the field to keep this confidence interval for the mean reasonably small. For example, if the researcher finds out that this confidence interval is too large for their purposes, he will have to, he or she will have to uh, take more samples to bring this interval down and in comparison, of course, to uncorrelated data. OK, and we can I think we can go back briefly to. Uh, script 351 by plan. Uh, in this script. In this script, um, uh, the simulated spatially distributed data, spatially correlated data, okay, are run through a Monte Carlo simulation. And what we will get from this script is the, a set of plots where we will be able to see uh, the relationship between the strength of the autocorrelation and the results of the tests. We are almost running out of time, so I will run it in the entire blocks and let's see the let's see the um, uh, let's see the plots which are presented in the book. Um, We'll be measuring error rate and uh, standard deviation. OK. OK, and let's see the script. That's the error rate. Plotted against Lambda Lambda. Uh, is a factor that uh, that uh, influences the strength of spatial correlation. For zero, the data are not spatially correlated, and we've got that error rate around 0 0.5 in t-test. With the increasing lambda, the error rate dramatically rises uh, is in, uh, increased dramatically we can see this is what i what i showed before that the mean of sample means is basically the same there is here is some artifact which is also explained in the book but it does not depend on lambda uh, that's the same effect as uh, I presented with the plants, this, the same number of plants in the field, and the only result on the statistical test is from the spatial distribution. Standard error. Mean estimated standard error. It's increasing slightly, but it's not affecting very much the um and the statistics and finally the standard deviation of mean 
yeah the, so that's the variability in data in samples uh, increases with the strength of the correlation mean stays the same but the variability is increasing and that uh, that is just throwing the, the t test out of the water uh, it's it's no longer functioning properly uh, because the uh, assumptions are violated uh, a neat explanation in the book is that every observation brings the full degree of freedom when it's independent but uh, and a degree of freedom is a measure of um, the strength of the sample, how many observations there are in the sample. When the observation is not independent, is dependent on the other, is correlated with the other, it's not bringing the entire, uh, the full degree of freedom into the, um, into the sample. So, effectively, the, um, effectively, the um, number of observations in the sample, the strength of the sample is going down. And this is why the variability uh, increases and the power of the test decreases. So, um, okay, so that was script 351, and I will not go any further today. And it will stop sharing my screen. Because the next stuff in chapter three is contiguity tables, contiguity matrices. And it's another hard part. I hope to be able to present it in the future. Thank you very much. Have you got any questions or are there any live people still staying? <laughs> Cheers, Shivak. Uh, no questions, but yeah, really enjoyed that. I hope you enjoyed my plants. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. See you in the future. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye.